In this video, we'll discuss the events that occurred in 2009 in the U.S. state of West Virginia. 32-year-old Stacy Smith was a mother of two children. A few days after Christmas, Stacy's father called 911 and reported that he had found his daughter without signs of life. When the police arrived at the crime scene, they found a message on the wall in her bedroom, which, apparently, was left by the perpetrator. Stacy Ann Smith was born on September 21, 1977. Family and friends described her as a beautiful and outgoing girl. She was a cheerleader at school and always attracted the guy's attention. After graduating high school, she met Stephen, whom she sincerely loved. She was ready to spend the rest of her life with him. In June 2002, the couple had a daughter, whom they named Mackenzie. Soon after, Stacy and Stephen got married. They were happy, and they thought this happiness would last forever. Four years later, the couple had a son, Landon. Soon after, Stacy and Stephen's relationship began to deteriorate, and eventually, they decided to break up. In 2009, her son Landon was three years old, and her daughter Mackenzie was seven. They lived in St. Albans, West Virginia. After breaking up with her husband, she tried everything to make her children happy. One day, and by chance, Stacy met a guy on the street who was in love with her when they were both in high school. His name was Brent. When they were in high school, Stacy didn't like him, but now their communication has gradually developed into a romantic relationship. Stacy had officially divorced her husband, Stephen. The latter knew she was rebuilding her personal life. He often saw Stacy and Brent together when he came to pick up the kids for the weekend. Brent got along well with Stacy's children, and she was happy about it. But over time, their relationship entered a rough patch. They sometimes quarreled, and most of the time, these quarrels were because of jealousy on Brent's part. He was trying to control some aspects of her life. When Stacy was talking to someone on the phone, he wanted to know who she was talking to. They broke up several times, reuniting once again after calming down. On Christmas Eve 2009, Stacy moved into a new house with her children. Her cousin Timothy and boyfriend Brent helped her decorate the house for Christmas and create a cozy atmosphere. A few days later, on December 28, 2009, Stacy's father, John Paul, tried to contact his daughter by phone, but she did not answer. When several hours had passed without Stacy answering the phone or calling back, John became worried and decided to find out what was wrong. He got into the car and drove to the house where Stacy lived with her children. They had moved into this house only a few days before Christmas, and John wanted to know if they were all right. When he arrived at the house, he did not see anything unusual. He knocked on the front door and called his daughter's name, but no one answered. The door was locked. Looking through the window, he saw three-year-old Landon there and was able to attract his attention. When Landon got closer, John asked where his mom was. The boy replied that she was asleep. John immediately realized that something was wrong. Stacy wasn't a heavy sleeper. She would wake up from the knocks on the door. John asked Landon to let him in and explained how to open the door. Once inside, John told the boy to sit in the living room while he went to check why Stacy wasn't waking up. Upon entering the kitchen, John found his daughter's body lying on the floor. He realized Stacy was dead. There were bloodstains everywhere in the kitchen and Stacy's bedroom. John immediately called 911 and asked for help. The police searched the house to make sure that the perpetrator was not hiding somewhere inside. There was no doubt Stacy's death wasn't an accident. The woman died from a stab wound to the neck. There was a message on one of the walls, which immediately attracted the attention of the detectives. The person who left it accused Stacy of infidelity. There were only two words in this message. The first word was cheating, and the second was a word starting with the letter W. It was also incredibly heartbreaking that Landon spent most of the day alone while his mother was dead. Forensics found the boy's bloody footprints on the floor next to Stacy's body. It indicated he was approaching his mother and probably trying to wake her up. He was only three years old and probably did not realize his mother wasn't just sleeping. 
The police seized all potential evidence from the house, including cigarette butts and beer cans, which could serve as a source of DNA. But the writing on the wall was of most interest to the investigators. It was necessary to find out who left it. There was every reason to assume that the motive of the crime was jealousy. Severe cruelty could also indicate that all this was about revenge. The culprit could be someone Stacy knew well and trusted. There were no signs of forced entry on the doors, which gave reason to assume that she had let the criminal into her home. Stacy's car and car keys were missing. Moreover, investigators did not find her phone and the crime weapon in the house. They passed on the information about the car to all patrolmen because the criminal could have used it to leave the crime scene. Stacy's death was a challenge for her loved ones especially for her children, who now needed to be explained that they would never see their mother again. Psychologists talked to Landon to find out if he saw anything unusual. Perhaps he saw the one who hurt his mom, but the boy could not help the police as he did not witness the moment of the crime. Waking up, he saw his mother on the floor and thought she was asleep. He went to her and tried to wake her up, but she was unresponsive. The suspect in this crime could be the person who believed that Stacy had cheated on him. At the investigation's initial stage, there were two potential suspects, Stacy's boyfriend, Brent, and her ex-husband, Stephen. Perhaps Stephen still loved Stacy, and although they divorced, he was angry that she found another man. As for Brent, he was jealous, and many people knew about it. Perhaps he suspected Stacy of cheating. When solving such cases, Investigators must check all possible versions, even if they sound absurd at first glance. So they were trying to find out if there was a man in Stacy's life that even the people closest to her didn't know about. She was young and attractive and worked as a doctor's assistant. Undoubtedly, men paid attention to her. While patrolmen were driving around the streets looking for Stacy's car, investigators talked to her family. After this conversation, Stacy's boyfriend Brent became suspect number one. Her family and friends knew that Brent was very jealous and often lost control of his emotions when he thought Stacy was communicating with someone other than him. He was a short-tempered man who could lose his temper for any reason, even an insignificant one. That's why Stacy stopped communicating with him several times. All of this made Brent the perfect suspect, so the detectives decided to find him and talk to him. They wanted to understand if he had anything to do with the crime and where he was when Stacy died and see how he would react to these questions. It wasn't difficult to find him. Brent was at his country house. Before going there, investigators obtained a search warrant. When they arrived at the house, Brent was in his garage. When he saw the police, he got nervous, but that didn't mean anything. Many people get worried when they see police officers on their doorstep. Investigators informed Brent about a search warrant for his home and that their visit was related to the investigation of Stacy Smith's death. The news of Stacy's death shocked Brent. He gave the impression of a man distraught with grief. But what if he was just a good actor? That's what the investigators tried to find out when they brought him to the police station for questioning. During the interrogation, Brent only increased the police's suspicions about him. He said that their relationship with Stacy wasn't stable. They often quarreled. According to him, the last quarrel between them occurred the day before her death. Brent told investigators that Stacy cheated on him with one of his friends, and even though a lot of time has passed since then, this betrayal has shaken their relationship. According to Brent, on December 27th, he went home after they quarreled. After calming down, he returned to Stacy's house a couple of hours later, where they had a quiet conversation. They were in her bedroom, and there was intimacy between them. He left at about 2 a.m. Stacy's son Landon and her cousin Timothy were in the house. They were both asleep. Brent claimed there were no problems between him and Stacy when he left. He went home and did not know that Stacy was dead until the police informed him about it. No one could confirm Brent's alibi. Therefore, Investigators had reason to doubt his story. They offered him to take a polygraph test to see how he would answer the questions. After some hesitation, Brent agreed to be tested because he didn't want to be on the suspect's list. He passed the test without any problems. 
At first, the police thought about removing him from the list of suspects. However, during the polygraph test, officers noticed a small red spot on Brent's shirt, similar to a spot of dried blood. Brent said that he had slightly injured himself the day before and that it was his blood, but only an expert examination could confirm or refute this statement. Trying to verify Brent's testimony, the detectives decided to talk to Stacy's cousin Timothy. After all, if Brent was telling the truth, Timothy was the last person to see Stacy alive. But there was a problem. No one knew where Timothy had gone. While the whole family gathered after the news of Stacy's death, Timothy disappeared. He didn't answer the phone, and no one knew where he might be. It worried the family members and the police. What if someone had kidnapped Timothy? There were such concerns because Timothy had previously had problems with illegal substances. Perhaps he owed money to someone, and they decided to take revenge on him, but something went wrong. It has become another version of the ongoing investigation. As I mentioned earlier, one of the first suspects in the crime was Stacy's ex-husband, Stephen. Perhaps he was angry about Stacy being in a relationship with Brent even before they officially divorced. Yes, they no longer lived together, but perhaps Stacy's behavior offended Stephen. What if this anger resulted in him committing the crime and leaving an offensive message on the wall? Besides, one of Stephen's motives could be his children. He could see them only on weekends, but perhaps he wanted the children to stay with him. When Stephen appeared at the police station for questioning, he behaved calmly and reasonably. He said he had nothing to do with Stacy's death and that he would never do that to the mother of his children. According to him, he and Stacy did not become enemies after the divorce. Stephen's idea of what happened to Stacy was the same as that of her family. He believed Brent was the one who committed this crime. He told investigators that Stacy and Brent's relationship was not stable. Stacy's ex-husband told about his whereabouts on the night of the crime. Soon after, the police confirmed his alibi and excluded him from the list of suspects. At the same time, trying to find out the location of Stacy's car, the investigators came across another oddity. As it turned out, it wasn't Stacy's car. Its owner was Stacy's boss, Dr. William Casto. It could mean that there was another man in Stacy's life. During the investigation, it became known that there was a romantic relationship between Stacy and her boss. Some colleagues said Stacy and Dr. Casto were very close, and at some point, he gave her a car. Thus, the police now had another potential suspect. Perhaps Dr. Casto somehow found out about her relationship with Brent. Maybe he decided to take his gift away. With all this in mind, the detectives started to search for Dr. Casto. He did not hide from anyone and led his usual way of life. After learning about Stacy's death and that investigators wanted to talk to him, William Casto came to the police station without any invitation. During the interrogation, he did not deny that there was an intimate relationship between him and Stacy and that he was the one who gave her the car. According to him, he and Stacy had been in a relationship for several years before her death. It was a consensual relationship. He gave her a car and helped her when she had any problems. Casto denied that he was involved in the crime. According to him, he had no reason to take Stacy's life. Casto was frank with the investigators and told them about his whereabouts on the night of the crime. The man had a reliable alibi, which allowed him to be cleared of suspicion. Thus, now the police had one less suspect, but who left the offensive message in Stacy's house? Who did she offend so much? Was there another man in her life? The police needed to answer all these questions. Meanwhile, using GPS tracking technology, the police determined the location of Stacy's car. It was in a deserted parking lot about five miles from her house all this time. The investigators were sure that this vehicle would be the key to solving this case. After finding the vehicle, patrol cars went there. The car was towed to the police parking lot so that experts could check it. While Stacy's credit cards and some of her belongings were in the car, there was no knife used in the commission of the crime or other evidence. Another unexpected twist in the investigation of this case occurred when the police checked the biography of Timothy, the missing cousin of Stacy. 
It turned out that he had previously had problems with the law, and there was something in his past that he wanted to hide. He was previously convicted of a sexual offense and theft. According to the accusation, he molested the girl. However, as Timothy claimed, she lied about her age. He thought this girl was of legal age. Timothy had to spend some time in prison because of this. He was also required to register as a sex offender, but he never did. Two days after Stacy's death, Timothy Ray Sutherland called the police and said he was staying at a local motel. According to him, he had nothing to do with Stacy's death. Since Timothy refused to register as a sex offender, the court issued a warrant for his arrest. But by the time the police arrived at the motel where Timothy was staying, he had managed to escape. However, there was a woman in the room with whom he had a relationship. The woman said Timothy was hiding in an abandoned trailer on the other side of the city. On the same day, December 30, 2009, he was arrested and taken to a police station. During the interrogation, investigators wanted to verify Brent's story that Timothy stayed in the house with Stacy and her son. Timothy confirmed that he was at his cousin's house that night. The cousin also stated that it was Brent who took Stacy's life. According to him, Brent wasn't a good person. He and Stacy were constantly fighting. That day, they quarreled right in front of his eyes. Timothy did not understand why Stacy was in a relationship with this man. He believed Brent was the man who did not love her and treated her without due respect. When asked why he left the crime scene and hid, Timothy replied that he was afraid they would arrest him because he had not registered as a sex offender. To summarize, Timothy blamed Brent for Stacy's death. However, after the investigators received the report from the laboratory, these accusations became less believable. The drop of dried blood on Brent's shirt was his blood, not Stacy's. The police couldn't find evidence that Brent was involved in this crime. Consequently, the circle of suspects has narrowed once again. Brent claimed Stacy, Timothy, and Landon were the only ones in the house when he left. Obviously, three-year-old Landon could not have been the one who committed this crime and left an offensive message on the wall. It meant Timothy was hiding something. Investigators noticed dried blood stains on his jeans. Hence, the police sent all his clothes to the laboratory for examination. But he still insisted that Brent was responsible for Stacy's death. However, the investigators continued pressuring him, and in the end, he told the truth. He said he thought Stacy was being stupid. She let Brent yell at her and forgave him every time. On the eve of her death, they quarreled in front of his eyes, and Brent left. But then, a few hours later, he returned, and Timothy was angry that Stacy had forgiven him again and let him into her bedroom. He understood what they were doing there. After Brent left, Timothy went to Stacy's bedroom to talk to her. What happened next is described in court documents without unnecessary details. That's what it says. In 2009, Mr. Sutherland was living temporarily at the home of his cousin, Stacy Smith, in St. Albans, West Virginia. In the early morning hours of December 28, 2009, Mr. Sutherland got into an argument with Miss Smith in her bedroom. The argument involved a comment made by Mr. Sutherland that Miss Smith's boyfriend did not treat her properly. During the argument, Miss Smith called Mr. Sutherland a junkie. Mr. Sutherland became outraged at being called a drug addict and left the bedroom. He then went into the kitchen and smoked a cigarette. Within a few minutes, he returned to the bedroom carrying a butcher knife. Mr. Sutherland fatally stabbed Miss Smith on the right side of her neck as she lay on the bed. Before fleeing the scene of the murder, Mr. Sutherland took Miss Smith's cell phone, credit card, money, and car keys. He also wrote the words, cheating whore, on a living room wall in the house. Timothy told investigators that after he injured Stacy, she was able to get out of bed and walk a few more steps. Her son was sleeping in another room, and her daughter was spending the night with friends. While Timothy was telling all this to the detectives, he was crying, and it seemed he was sincerely remorseful. He also told them where he had put the weapon of the crime. He threw the knife that he used to take Stacy's life out the car window, not far from Stacy's house. Later, the police found this knife in the place Timothy specified. Laboratory analysis showed that there was Stacy's blood on his jeans. All this was enough to bring charges. 
When asked why he wrote these words on the wall, he replied that he wanted Stacy's boyfriend to become a suspect in the crime. Everyone knew Stacy and Brent often quarreled, and he wanted everyone to think that Brent had taken her life out of jealousy. But Brent believed that wasn't the only reason. Brent thought Timothy was in love with his cousin and was jealous of her. That night, he sat in an armchair in the living room and heard everything Brent and Stacy were doing in the bedroom. Perhaps jealousy made him lose his temper and do something no one can fix. The police considered the possibility that Timothy could have unsuccessfully tried to persuade Stacy into intimacy after Brent left the house. Yet, they found no evidence to confirm this. Only two people knew what happened that night, and one of them was dead. Although Timothy Sutherland fully admitted his guilt during interrogation, he declared his innocence at the first court hearing in 2010. But the authorities had enough evidence to convict him. The only question was who the jury would believe. The prosecutor who claimed that the crime was premeditated or the lawyer who said that his client committed the crime in a state of passion. However, the fact that Timothy left her bedroom after an argument with Stacy, went to the kitchen, smoked a cigarette there, and then took a knife and returned, indicated that he was aware of what he was doing. On March 18, 2011, Timothy Ray Sutherland was found guilty. The court sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In 2013, he attempted to appeal the verdict, but failed. 